this month's session is going to cover a lot of ground. We're going to talk about servicing performance cars and performance engines available in Chrysler Corporation cars. Up till just recently, servicing high performance cars has been a broad, highly specialized, and extremely technical subject. The reason for this was that very few factory-built performance cars were available and most cars were modified and made into performance cars after they left the showroom. Naturally, these cars were serviced by the owners themselves or by the few mechanics around town who specialized in performance or hot rod work. However, the performance car scene has changed quite a bit the last couple of years. Chrysler Corporation has for some time now offered a wide variety of performance cars to the buying public. These buyers expect, demand, and should get the same service as the other owners. Some dealers appear to be reluctant or not properly equipped to service and advise owners of performance models. I hope that this session will fill you master technicians in on what is happening to the performance market why performance service is becoming big business, and most important, how to service performance type cars. At many dealerships, the picture is changing. The other day I attended a special meeting at Scott Motors concerning performance. Mr. Scott, the owner, had asked the entire dealership, sales, parts, and service departments to attend. Mr. Scott also asked his performance expert, Terry Marker, to conduct this little seminar on performance car super tuning and modification for strip and maximum street performance. Here's what went on that day at Scott Motors. I'm glad that the sales and parts departments are in attendance tonight. Sales of performance cars affects the entire dealership as much as the sale of any other car. When I'm through, I'll turn the show over to Terry, our performance specialist. First of all, the 1969 model year had the widest selection of youth appeal cars and the biggest spread of performance cars yet. This year's performance car sales are approaching 20% of all sales. Now, that's a pretty healthy chunk of any market. And that's what this meeting is all about, performance cars. Let's make a quick rundown on the models that are easiest to spot as performance cars. Now, generally, these models cannot be bought without a performance engine. In the Dodge line, the Charger RT is probably the best-known performance car. In the Coronet models, it's the RT and Super B. The little guys in the Dodge Hive are the Dart GT Sport and Dart Swinger 340. Plymouth offers the well-known Roadrunner, the GTX, and the Mighty Might, the Barracuda. But that's not all. Here's the lineup of what are considered performance engines. You'll find one of these in the performance models you just saw. Of course, if you run across one with anything smaller than a 340, it's not considered a performance model. On the other hand, these engines are offered as options in some standard models. So it would be a good idea to acquaint yourself with these engines so you can spot them in the family grocery wagon. The 440s are standard equipment on some full-size models to compensate for weight, power accessories, and air conditioning. Our sales force has been well-oriented in regards to performance models and optional performance engines. We're selling more performance cars every day, and buyers of performance cars are paying a premium for their cars. They expect and demand the same, if not more, service than other customers. Usually, performance enthusiasts are more vocal and more influential than most other customers. Owners of performance models are more exacting and discriminating in their demands than the average customer. It pays to satisfy their demands. We've found that satisfied owners of performance cars favorably influence prospects for both performance and standard production models. Dissatisfied owners can cost sales of both. Well, I think I've said about everything I can on the subject of performance. Want to take it from here, Terry? Okay, Mr. Scott, and thanks for making my part of it a little easier. Sometimes it's easy to get confused about what is and what isn't considered a performance car. I guess the whole problem really starts with the word itself, performance. 
Every car owner wants good performance out of his car, and that's only natural. However, the performance car owner usually wants that little extra something out of his machine, and that little something is maximum performance. Every performance car we sell is carefully tuned before delivery. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that the car as delivered from the factory will be running bad. It's just that assembly line operations don't lend themselves to critical tuning performance engines deserve. Starting with the carburation, make sure that all air fuel adjustments are precise. Check the manuals and service bulletins for the specs and procedures. You might want to refer back to Master Tech Session number 699. It's got all the latest dope on four barrel carbs. Check the float level, accelerator pump stroke, idle speed, fuel mixture, and on the AVS, the secondary air valve and the secondary throttle opening sequence. Of course, there are other adjustments, but if you take care of these, you'll be in pretty good shape. And when you're sure the fuel situation is right, you better make sure there's a spark there at the right time for ignition and proper combustion. Check the distributor dwell, and if necessary, set the contact gap. Check the ignition timing to make sure that it is dead right. How about the plugs? I was just coming to that. On performance cars, we check the plugs to make sure they're the right type and heat range. Check the gap and adjust if necessary. And when you're installing the plugs, make sure the gasket, if required, is seated properly and always torque the plugs to the correct specs. This eliminates the possibility of cracking the insulator. As a final precaution, check all ignition cables at both the plugs and distributor cap. Make sure they're on tight when you connect them. What's next, Harry? Well, Tech, there's always the guy that wants his car to run a little bit better than the rest and still be as streetable as Aunt Martha's station wagon. He can do this with spending very little money and a bare minimum of part changes. We call this little operation super tuning. The most obvious thing to do is try and get more gas into the cylinders. A couple of thousands bigger jets are the first thing to install. Then to go along with the bigger jets, change the accelerator pump linkage to get a long stroke. While you're at it, make sure the float level is at the maximum setting to let you store the extra fuel that the big jets and long pump stroke will need. Because of the richer mixture, you'll need more spark advance because a rich mixture burns slower and must be ignited sooner. In addition to the extra advance, low speed torque and throttle response can be improved by changing the slope of the distributor advance curve. To rework the advance curve, remove the heavier governor spring and stretch the other spring to give the desired curve. Be sure to leave enough spring tension to retard the advance while starting. And, in most cases, the full advance should be completed by 1,200 to 1,500 RPM crankshaft speed. And make sure the total advance is limited to 34 to 38 degrees. If any technician isn't exactly sure about how to change the curve, the easiest thing to do is replace the single point distributor with a dual point system. Of course, whichever you do, make sure to always use the best Chrysler points available. They'll throw a better and more consistent spark and last a lot longer when subjected to high RPM running. In the spark plug department, a slight change will be necessary. Normally, recommended heat ranges will be adequate, but if the owner plans on extensive high RPM operation, it'll be necessary to go one or two steps colder on the plugs. Just to make sure that spark reaches the plug at full power, I'd suggest installing solid wire ignition cables from the distributor to the plugs. The only thing is, when you install solid wire cables, always install resistor plugs along with them. If you don't, your customer may be unhappy because of radio interference from the cables. That should take care of the ignition. For the final touch, wire open or eliminate the manifold heat control valve. Again, ask the customer if this is acceptable to him. Remind him that the warm-up performance will be a little rougher and complete warm-up will take a little longer. That wraps up the subject of super tuning performance cars. I want to mention at this point that customers should be informed of possible warranty restrictions connected with modifications for racing. I think the next area that Terry is going to cover pertains to this subject, so why don't we see what he has to say? I think we've turned enough RPMs to finish this side of the record. Will someone please turn it?
Modification for maximum street or drag strip performance is a pretty large topic to discuss. There are a lot of things you can do to a performance car without even getting into the heads or block. But before we get into that, Mr. Scott mentioned warranty, and I mentioned drag strip, so let's clear that up right now. You better tell your customers just like it is. For all practical purposes, racing or participation in other competitive speed events voids the warranty. When it comes to modifications, unauthorized alterations or use of parts or material not approved by Chrysler Corporation will also void the warranty. But that doesn't mean there aren't plenty of authorized adjustments and approved parts goodies available for the customer that wants some customized performance service. So let's get back to the performance bag. If they haven't been done before, all of the procedures for super tuning must be done along with the strip modifications. Just like any hard playing athlete needs his Wheaties, a performance engine must be fed right if it's gonna run hard. Let's take a look at fuel induction and see what can be done to improve it. On performance cars, flooding and vapor lock can be prevented by installing the correct fuel pressure regulator in the fuel delivery system. If the car doesn't already have one, installing an unsilenced air cleaner will improve the breathing. The other alternative is to install a hot rod or bonnet type air cleaner approved by Chrysler. But remember, the extra air coming in is going to affect the air-fuel mixture. Always reset the idle speed and fuel mixture after installing a different air cleaner. If you want to modify the stock system, several intake manifold and carburetor combinations are readily available that can increase performance, depending on which system the particular engine is equipped with. Let's see what's available. For best results over the entire RPM range, use the Edelbrock single quad high rise manifold. For the 340 engines, use a Holley 700 CFM carburetor. For the other engines, use the Holley 780 CFM carb. If a 440 is equipped with a Carter AVS, increased performance is easily obtained by changing to a Carter AFB or Holley 850 CFM job for engine speeds up to 5,000 RPM. For best performance above the 4,000 RPM range, use the factory dual quad intake mounting with the Carter AFB carburetors. If you use the dual quad setup, bake-like spacers should be used between the carburetors and manifold to eliminate heat buildup in the float bolts. If the spacers are not available, use a stack of five or six carburetor mounting gaskets. That takes care of the fuel department. The next thing is to make sure you have the spark to ignite the fuel charge. If the car is to be used primarily for drag racing, install the super stock transistorized ignition. If you use the transistorized ignition, you should install the Hemi super stock points also. Now these points are shorter, lighter, and will run at much higher speeds without encountering point bounce. But be careful, these points are designed for the transistorized ignition. They must not be used with the standard ignition system. For street use with a transistorized ignition, the standard recommended plug should be used. But if you plan on extensive high RPM operation or drag racing, you should use plugs that are one or two steps colder. There's a few more things you can do under the hood to improve performance. The stock cooling system is adequate to keep operating temperatures to accepted levels. However, some components can be changed to reduce power losses in the system. The torque control drive fan can be installed in place of the stock fan. You should also replace the water pump impeller with the one used with air conditioning. This impeller has a smaller diameter and offers less resistance. To really keep cool, a maximum cooling high performance radiator and seven blade torque drive fan can be installed if the car is not so equipped. That's about all we have time to cover on super tuning and competition modification. Incidentally, there's one setup that you should be on the lookout for. You may not have seen any yet, but they're selling like hotcakes and it won't be too long before you see one in for service. I'm talking about the three two barrel setup available on the 440 engines. The service manuals were printed long before the three two barrels were available, so they won't have any service procedures for the Holly two barrels. A service bulletin has been issued on the system, but let's review it just the same. Now, here's how it works. 
the two end carburetors don't have the usual choke, power enrichment, idle, and spark advanced systems. Each carburetor is equipped with a throttle control vacuum diaphragm. This diaphragm is the same as on the four barrels and requires no service. The two end carburetors are connected to the center carburetor slotted throttle lever by two adjustable connector rods. The slotted throttle lever of the center carb allows the throttle valves to open on the end carburetors as vacuum requires and close mechanically with the controlling center carburetor. Basically, the center carb on the three two-barrel system is the same as the primary side of the four-barrel carburetor. The end carburetors are the same as the secondary portion of the four barrels, so don't let them throw you when you have to service them. The basic adjustments are the same with the exception of the specifications. Check the service bulletin when making any adjustment. The end throttle valves must be synchronized with the center throttle valve. This is another adjustment that may be a little strange to you. I'm going to run through it, although you may have studied your bulletin carefully. It's done this way. If the adjustment is to be done on the vehicle, be sure the ignition switch is off. This de-energizes the fast idle solenoid so that clearance is obtained between the plunger and fast idle adjusting screw. Remove the air cleaner, then remove the end carburetor throttle connector rod clips and disengage the front and rear rods from the throttle levers. Close the throttle valves on all three carbs and hold in the closed position. Shorten or lengthen the front and rear connector rods by turning in or out in the threaded sleeve. Adjust until the rod can enter the hole in the throttle lever evenly. After installing the throttle connector rod and the end carburetor throttle levers, secure with spring clips. Readjust idle speed to 900 RPM for automatics and 1,000 RPM for manual transmissions. Checking the wet fuel level on the Holly two-barrel is slightly different than the four-barrel. Before checking the wet fuel level, check the fuel pump pressure to be certain that a five-pound reading is obtained. Start the engine and remove the sight plug from each carburetor. Using a wrench and screwdriver, turn the adjusting nut either up or down until fuel just dribbles out of the sight hole. Reinstall the sight plugs and gaskets and tighten securely. Let me suggest something at this point. It's a good idea to place a container under the bowl before removing plugs to catch any fuel that might run out due to a high or improper previous setting. Here's a final reminder. If you're reassembling or installing a new part, make sure that the parts have been thoroughly cleaned and are kept as clean as possible while you're installing them. Another thing, observe all factory torque specs for all fasteners and also follow the factory tightening sequence if there is one. Well, that's about it. I hope that this little get together has been informative to all of you. I know there's a lot we didn't cover, but maybe sometime in the future we'll pick up and cover some of the internal and driveline modifications. And remember, our factory service rep has been very helpful to us with any performance questions we've come up with. If you have any questions right now, I'll try to answer as many as I can. Why don't we have a coffee break first, and then we'll... Well, guys, that's how Scott Motors is handling the big performance push. I found it pretty informative. <laughs> Truth is, when I left, I kind of felt a little bit out of it. I guess like most people, I just wasn't aware how big performance is getting. You master technicians are also going to have to practice a little bit more customer relations with owners of performance cars. Most of them like to stand by while the work is being done rather than drink coffee in the waiting lounge. You may also have to suffer through a little extra conversation and possibly some volunteer diagnosis. But in turn, you'll have a steady customer and possibly some referrals to other performance owners. And remember, these owners have paid a premium for the performance features on their car. And all they ask is to feel a difference for the period they own the car. I see we're just about out of time, so I'll have to wrap this session up. But before I split, I'll throw in the usual reminder to read your reference book thoroughly. It contains some info we didn't have time to cover and some performance specs, which will be plenty helpful. See you at the next session. You'll get the lowdown on service features for the 70s.